everybody for this class on the most timely topic of uh, on uh, turf, turf grass so i i think uh, most of you have been attending the classes so far and uh, um, been getting benefit out of attending the classes uh, we today uh, my name is suma mudan and i am a forbin master gardener for the last uh, eight years and um, i am um, uh, handling these classes for this year and Nancy is the uh, program director for all the classes uh, that we do for the community. So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Boone Holiday. Uh, he is our uh, uh, Aggie horticulture agent for Fort Bend County and uh, he works very closely with Fort Bend Master Gardeners. We are sister organizations and uh, I have had the pleasure of uh, working with Boone for the last several years and uh, hearing his classes. Uh, and I one thing before I tell you a little bit about him is that Boone uh, knows so many things about so many things. So he's a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, he's the right person to ask any question related to anything to do with uh, a green stuff like plant, anything. So feel free to post your questions in the chat while he's uh, doing the seminar and you will have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask questions live at the end of the class if you have any specific questions so during the class if you put your questions in the chat we will try to answer those as the class goes on now a little bit about boone boone holds a, an undergrad degree in horticulture from stephen austin state university and master's degree in agricultural education from Texas A&M University. Long before attaining these degree titles, he was an avid gardener and a plant nerd uh, and an young plant enthusiast. He brings previous experience as horticulture staff at Moody Gardens in Galveston, producers cooperative in Bryan and Texas A&M Horticulture in College Station. Having work experience in many horticultural areas and industry, from retail horticulture to landscape design and irrigation installation, he brings that knowledge paired with enthusiasm into Fort Bend County programming efforts. He's happily married to wife Sony, uh, who is a wonderful uh, grower of flowers. Uh, he is the proud father of uh, to daughter Bailey, and they live in Full Share, Texas. So now it is to you, Boone. Thank you for doing this class for us today. You're very welcome, Suma. Thank you for your leadership and thank you, Nancy, for uh, uh, helping to direct our educational programs. And uh, we're glad that y'all folks took time out of your day today. Not that we want to be outside uh, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Um, with 102 degree temperatures. We're, we're um, measuring outside of our office here in Rosenberg. Uh, so you picked a good place to be. We are going to talk about turf grass. I'm going to try to share my screen. <clears throat> and we are going to power up PowerPoint and get this party started. OK, Suma, can you see, see my screen OK there? Yes, we can see the screen. Oh, fantastic. OK, <clears throat> today's program is on lawn care basics. I'm gonna to try to do my best to stay on task and on time. I think the last time we did this, I went about 30, 40 minutes over. Um, so I'm gonna roll through it pretty quick. Uh, if there's a slide or a portion of that that you need a little bit more clarity on, as Suma mentioned, go ahead and uh, dabble that into the chat feature and she'll slow me down and we'll make sure we get your questions and needs addressed. Uh, today's uh, program outline uh, is every, everything turf uh, from uh, physiology, uh, species selection, renovation of lawns, maintenance, weed problems, uh, disease, and insects. <clears throat> this program um, has been adapted from uh, a presentation created by Michael Potter, who is my cohort in Montgomery County. So thanks, Michael. And let's get going. Turf grass, the benefits of turf grass, you know, um, 
this one is uh, is difficult to explain to people, especially when we get into periods of drought and we're using water. Um, people start pointing fingers and they point at turf grass. Um, but I think if we really, you know, we, we put everything together, uh, we would quickly realize that the benefits of turf grass uh, significantly outweigh the negative aspects as uh, considered uh, a water use. But as we get into water uh, as a portion of the presentation, we'll begin to understand that we really don't need that much water uh, to sustain a really good looking stand of turf grass. So we can see by a little finger here, got this little frog in the grass. Uh, if you get up in the mornings or at late in the evening, quite an amount of uh, diversity of life that takes advantage of that stand of grass. So little bitty things in there are living and persisting in that turf. So that's a good thing. Um, we can utilize uh, turf to uh, absorb and, and um, uh, be able to remedy uh, potential environmental pollutants. Uh, we can remediate uh, soils that have been contaminated. Uh, we can offset the uh, urban heat island effect uh, by absorbing uh, some of the, uh, the UV. We can improve water infiltration and retention in areas, particularly when we get heavy rainfalls, is having that water penetrate into the soil instead of um, going straight off into our storm drains. We can control soil erosion. Uh, we can create a pleasant aesthetic environment that is therapeutic. Um, Suma does uh, quite a bit of yoga. Uh, so a nice, beautiful, uh, maintained stand of turf grass. Great place for um, exercising and therapy. Uh, and sports and rec recreational activities and social events. The list goes on and on. Um, turf is a good thing. Uh, so uh, first on our agenda is turf grass physiology. Let's talk about grass versus turf grass. Um, we have about 500 species of grasses uh, that are native that grow in the state of Texas. But there's just a portion of those that um, we can actually call turf grass. And this is that they not only survive mowing, uh, but they can persist in a landscape uh, with soil compaction and traffic. So as we're running across there playing Frisbee, uh, we want a species of grass that can persist through that stress. <clears throat> so this kind of so shows you side by side. We look at the picture on the right. This is all the parts of uh, a grass plant. Okay, this is ground level. We have our roots, our node, stem here, bud, leaf sheath, collar, and then the blade angling out. This is typical of the majority of grasses. Um, but when we look at turf grass, we not only have this, but we have these things here, this green and this black, okay? So this black, what this is underground, is a stem that we call a rhizome that as this plant matures, this rhizome grows out and then forms a new plant, pops up, moves around, forms a new plant. Okay, this is the underground. Okay, very similar to that is what we call stolon. And this is an underground stem. I mean, above ground stem that, that moves across, roots, grows, moves across above ground, roots at, at ground contact, comes back up. So what makes a, a, a better turf grass is a grass that can do at least one of these two. So that as we plant the grass, it starts to fill in, it starts to migrate across the surface so that we have a nice uh, full stand of grass in an area. And if we end up having some damage in these spots, and the fact that these plants are growing out in different directions, then that can fill in very quickly. So we look at factors that would impact the species that we select for growing turf. Uh, one, uh, the quality and availability of water, the amount of shade, the intensity of use. So if we've got pets, if you've got kids running around out there, um, <clears throat> the amount of mowing, 
that we're willing to do and the other levels of maintenance that we're that we're um, capable and willing to provide to maintain a, a healthy stand of grass. So the first one here, density, <clears throat> as we can see in the picture on the, on the left here, very, very thick uh, stand uh, versus a low, low density stand um, here on the right. Uh, each of these comes with benefits and negatives. The benefit being the aesthetics and the feel, uh, color of having a dense, uh, well manicured turf um, versus this is uh, this low, low density, a turf that would want to grow taller. Uh, this is going to take less care as far as fertility and water. Uh, the shorter we cut this, then the demands on that grass as far as inputs tend to go way up. We want to look at texture of a grass. We have fine textured grasses versus coarse texture. And, and again, here, <clears throat> the fine texture, people tend to like this better because it feels nice on the feet versus a coarse texture like our St. Augustine um, or some of the zoysias. Um, the, the benefit here is going to be shade tolerance because with coarse, you have these larger leaf blades. The larger the leaf blade, the more that that grass is capable of absorbing sunlight through photosynthesis than, than this one is. So these ones tend to grow better in shady situations than our fine textured grasses. So here's a picture, an example of St. Augustine with our stolons that I mentioned. And the good thing about this is that, you know, we start, obviously, you see a line where we started planting that grass. And as it grows in, it starts to migrate into these voids, rooting and further establishing the turf grass area. A great thing. <clears throat> St. Augustine grass only has stolons. It does not have rhizomes. We look at this one here. Uh, this is a, a well manicured hybrid Bermuda grass. Uh, we pull that and flip it over. When we look underneath it, we see these runners underground, and these are our rhizomes that will move around underground and help expand this turf grass into new areas and also fill in areas that may have been damaged for one reason or another. And then some grasses, like our fescues, uh, are bunch type grasses that start in one spot and they don't really uh, have stolons or rhizomes, but just as they mature, those bunches just grow out into all different directions and that bunch just gets wider and wider as it gets more mature. Hopefully at some point, each of these bunches would migrate into each other and, and you would get a full uh, canopy across this area. So the next thing with um, uh, considerations are our warm season species versus cool season. And we have quite a few warm season species um, for manicured turf grass, particularly in suburban situations. Uh, we're gonna see Bermuda grass and St. Augustine grass. Uh, some of these other ones you'll see uh, randomly. Uh, Bahia grass um, is a pretty common field grass. Um, and um, <clears throat> for, for a, a very a low maintenance, low manicured situation, that is what you would tend to see. But uh, what we have really in Fort Bend are Bermuda grass and St. Augustine grass. For a cool season, um, we don't see uh, really any of these uh, as far as a perennial grass species. Uh, we're just too far south for these. We just don't really have a long enough cool season and we have a very miserable warm season. I don't know if I would even call it a warm season um, that these plants would all die uh, with this heat, with this dry and heat that we're experiencing. They, these would all be gone. But the annual ryegrass, uh, fescue <clears throat> and perennial ryegrass, um, people will overseed these for the cool season months. Uh, but as soon as the temperatures warm up, typically by the end of May, these grasses are dead and gone. So we look at our climate map as far as grasses go. We're right on these line between the orange and purple. 
which describes us as being hot, humid, tropical, hot and humid at the border of tropical. Sounds great, doesn't it? Hot and humid. Uh, that's really explains where we're at right now. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the cool season grasses, uh, particularly if you if you've moved here from northern states, those are going to be the grasses that you would be familiar with. Uh, but for us, you know, this line right here, uh, kind of from lower New Mexico across the southeast belt, uh, this is where we would see the turf grasses that, that are commonly used here along the Gulf Coast. Yep, there we are. All right, so cool season uh, growth calendar. Uh, what we see with the cool season grasses is one thing to note is that they're not winter grasses. They're not cold season grasses, they're cool season grasses. So considering that, what we see with them is in midwinter, they're not really growing. They start their growth late winter and, and, and into spring and they spurt up with a big growth and then the summertime, they slow down and they're, they're kind of going dormant. And then in the fall, you'll see another smaller wave of growth uh, before the temperatures start to drop off in the middle of winter. And this corresponds with people that overseed with ryegrass here. Um, you know, if you don't plant it at the right time, if you wait till December or January to seed it and you wonder why you're not seeing any growth, is because it doesn't really want to grow while it's cold out. You have to plant that overseed grass way up here um, in September, uh, into August, September, so that it can germinate and it can grow during the cooler temperatures in the fall, but prior to winter cold establishing. For our warm season grasses, whoa, hey, um, for our warm season grasses, we just about April 1st, what we see is the grass waking up and it just grows and grows. And then it starts to fizzle back out as we cool off for the winter. So this this will be this graph will be utilized several times during the presentation to kind of uh, accentuate our inputs that we might be doing throughout the year. So with the selection of grasses, each of them have their benefits and negatives. Um, looking at the two that are common for us, strengths are Bermuda grass, our uh, heat tolerance, drought tolerance, traffic uh, and damage and disease, but does not like shade at all. So when you start, when those live oaks start growing and you've got Bermuda grass, it's gonna start going away pretty fast. Uh, and then coming down to St. Augustine grass, uh, its strength is shade tolerance. Now, I added this word here, tolerance, because it doesn't like shade. There's not any of these grasses that like shade, but it's tolerant to some amount of shade. So we have to keep that in mind when we plant these or we're, 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 we're making these grasses work in landscape situations is that they don't really want to be in that shade, uh, but they can handle some amount of it. Weaknesses is cold damage and traffic damage, uh, responding to traffic damage. So for St. Augustine, um, that, this just looks fantastic. Um, whatever they're doing, they're doing it right. But this would be what we would see here in the growth zone. And when we get up just right south of the uh, Dallas Metroplex, we start running out of functionality for this grass because it gets too cold. Um, it just, it, it'll start to freeze on us uh, as we get into a more persistent, longer cold periods. Um, <clears throat> a lot of standby varieties. We've got a couple new St. Augustine selections that are poised to show up on the market here in the next year or two. So we're looking forward to that. Um, around here, um, Del Mar, uh, rally are going to be uh, some of the more common ones that we see um, available uh, at the turf farms. For Bermuda grass, um, we have our hybrids. Uh, 
which tend to be the very more the more dense, finer textured, lower growing uh, cultivars uh, compared to our common standards that we have available. <clears throat> for um, for our hybrid, uh, Tifway has been a long long time standard. When we get into um, uses of a Bermuda, hybrid Bermuda, which these are typically for sports fields, for golf courses, and, and uh, multiple use uh, sports uh, complexes. For our common, we've got a good selection here for us. Uh, common or this celebration is the one that we see quite a bit in uh, suburban or landscape situations, homeowner situations. And for, for our zoysia, we really kind of break this down into two species. We have the madrella and the japonica. Madrella being this, this lower cut, very fine textured grass, and the japonica uh, growing uh, very similar to St. Augustine and its wider uh, leaf uh, appearance, um, but not quite as aggressive as far as width and height but this japonica, uh, it's actually uh, much more compact looking than our, than our common uh, St. Augustine grass. <clears throat> so good, good wins with this, with uh, the downside to uh, zoysia is that we, um, we have to pay more attention to how we mow these grasses because we can, we can quickly uh, cause uh, rotation from rotary mowers. Uh, in this, or we can scalp the japonica varieties too short, um, and then thatch buildup is, is also a big issue in both of these. <clears throat> so for this, uh, for the matrella type, we, uh, probably emerald is going to be the top one we'll see around here, and then our uh, palisades is going to be the one we see the most with the japonica. For our, our dormant, our winter color on these grasses, um, mostly brown, but St. Augustine is the one that we we tend to see still some green. There's a little bit of this bronzing or maroon coloration as it goes into dormancy. Uh, you do see some brown out in here, but doesn't tend to go all the way brown. Um, Bermuda grass, so I see a centipede uh, will uh, go uh, full dormant, particularly if we start winter with consistent cold weather, um, it will go completely uh, brown on us. And that's a good thing. I think people need to accept the fact that our grasses are going dormant, uh, that do need to go into dormancy and be okay with the fact that they're brown. I think a lot of people um, want to try to keep these grasses green year round, and it's not a, it's not a good idea. So the next one we're talking about species is drought tolerance. Um, our Bermuda grass and really buffalo grass is the highest of the common species. And then we move down. So as we see here, St. Augustine is, is not at the top of the list, um, but, it's, but it's really not bad. And we'll get into water use and water needs here in a second, and we'll, we'll be able to dive down deeper into that. Um, Suma, does anybody want to take a stab of, of what uh, species of turf this is? Is this uh, Bermuda? Does anybody want to want to take a stab at it in the chat feature? Nobody? Any guesses? We have two guesses of Bermuda. Boone. Okay. This is an artificial turf. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I was fooled by seeing the edges because it just had a little. It does know. look like it's, it's kind of. Yeah, migrating. it's natural. Yeah. And I've seen more of these installations around um, a couple uh, car dealerships I've noticed have, have moved away from uh, live turf and, and gone into artificial turf. Um, 
I will say that, you know, the technology is getting better as far as the look and the feel of the products that are out there. But, you know, there's one thing <clears throat> that they haven't figured out how to address is, is uh, heat up. These, these, these artificial turfs um, have a hard time during this you know, direct sun and the high temperatures of the summer um, of being able to stay cool. As we see here, we did some testing <clears throat> with a temperature gauge and you know, midsummer and full sun in a Bermuda grass lawn, we've got a temperature of 104 asphalt, which is hot enough for me at 136 and then 165 degrees for our artificial turf surface. Um, a little too hot, you know, particularly uh, for a home um, situation. If you have pets that need to go out during the day to relieve themselves. Uh, that's torture right there. So um, something I think the industry is moving into technologies where they can address this. Uh, I even uh, I've heard of kind of way off technologies of of uh, solar uh, photovoltaic capture of, um, of UV uh, with an artificial or synthetic turf situation where we can harvest um, energy uh, from the sun, like a solar panel. Um, I don't know how far that's off, but beyond that, just trying to create a design that, that, that can handle um, absorbing or radiating uh, heat to keep the surface a little cooler than this is something that they're going to need to do before that becomes a, a widespread uh, realistic option. <clears throat> do we have any questions uh, before I move on to the next section, Suma? No, I don't see any questions so far. Okay. All right. So you just decided that um, we need to redo the lawn completely and do something different. Or if you're building a new um, home or a new site, uh, things to be thinking about <clears throat> when um, we can get ahead of it. Most of the time we, we adopt um, somebody else's issues uh, from the past. Um, but if we're in a situation where we can create a, um, a plan from the get-go, uh, we're in a good situation. Um, so the first thing is soil, uh, soil quality. Um, if you have the opportunity to bring in and incorporate a good quality soil that's non-compacted uh, onto the site, that's a good thing to do. Um, <clears throat> a loam or a sandy loam uh, soil is best. Uh, and the ideal depth of that is eight to 12 inches to allow the roots to penetrate down deep into the soil profile. Um, <clears throat> this picture here, uh, this is not from our neck of the woods. This is probably from somewhere in central Texas, but uh, this is a pretty good example. Uh, we see here that we've got about a half inch to one inch of uh, topsoil and about two inches of subsoil that's sitting on top of this caliche rock. Um, these are a lot of situations as we move further out west. Uh, it just shows you what this grass is up against. Uh, it does, there's not enough depth there that this grass is ever going to be able to grow in and perform like they want it to. Thus, the reasons why you're seeing uh, quite a bit of uh, sparse areas and erosion uh, because of a lack of canopy of turf in the, on this hillside. <clears throat> so here, you know, we see this quite a bit, a lot of weeds in spots as the turf diminishes um, and we're not doing the right things. We can get a takeover of weedy vegetation uh, that it would be enough for us to decide uh, or make a decision to either try to continually work on this or start over from scratch. And looking at this picture, I think I would start over from scratch. <clears throat> so when we're, when we're looking at that, maybe we have the wrong variety or the wrong species, uh, the percentage of turf cover, uh, the, the voids that we have, 
maybe we have an infestation from uh, uh, aggressive uh, species of grasses or weeds. And we may have some perennial weeds in there, uh, like a dollar weed, um, uh, 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 sedges, like our purple or yellow nut sedge, um, quite a few really noxious perennial weeds that it might just be better for us to just start over, clear everything out, uh, fix the soil, and, um, and re-sod the area. Um, we talk about aeration quite a bit with folks, uh, looking at the, the ways to do this. Um, this is a pretty large machine, but you know, I was just down at, at Lowe's down the street last week and you know, between them, Home Depot or other rental services, <clears throat> they do make some pretty small uh, lawn aerators. They're easy for most people to handle and a uh, good thing to be thinking about uh, in our turf grass areas. Uh, a good example here is, is soil. So picture on the right, it's an example of a compacted uh, soil profile. When we get that compacted like that, we, we, we start taking out space for, for oxygen. If we don't have air pockets in the soil, then we lose the ability for the plants to respire. And um, then things start going the wrong direction. So we want loose soil. So to get that, we try to break this up more and allow some pockets of air so that oxygen and moisture can move down into the profile. Um, this thatch buildup, this is another good reason to aerate as, um, you know, whether it's from, from watering, scalping, uh, previous insect or disease problems, uh, we wanna break through this so that when we do get rainfall, that rain can penetrate through this mat of thatch and it can move down into the soil. If we get a quarter inch of rain and we have this much thatch, there's a pretty good chance that the thatch layer is gonna sponge up and block most of that moisture from actually even getting to the soil where the roots are. Uh, not a good, not a good thing. Question, Boone. Yeah. Uh, what is the, when is the good time to aerate? Which part of the year or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I got a slide coming up on that. Soon. Oh, okay. Okay. Pro probably will knock it out. Um, so the thatch, you know, this is just a, per a problem that a lot of folks have is just by uh, ac excessive uh, nitrogen applications, uh, poor watering practices, and pH um, issues yeah, where we may have a high pH situation. Um, <clears throat> so just kind of showing what, what we're doing here, we start off and we have this thatch layer in the shallow root system and this compacted uh, uh, subsoil. So by us creating these divots, we're allowing water and oxygen to penetrate deeper into the soil profile. And actually when we do this, another thing that happens is that allows nutrients that may have not been available to the plant because they were stored down deep into the compacted soil to be actually uh, become dislodged and through uh, absorption with water to migrate back up into the root zone. And then the, the gradual outcome is that we have a, a thicker uh, grass surface and a deeper root system where these roots are actually able to continually penetrate deeper into the profile, mining for water and nutrients. All right, so here we go. Here's the uh, answer to our question, Suma. Uh, again, we're using this uh, annual chart or calendar of growth for the warm season grasses. Is really this green oval, this is our, I would consider our peak window of opportunity that starts about April 15th. Um, <clears throat> that's when the grass is starting to put on roots, uh, starting to kick up some, some foliar growth. So we're not doing that much damage to the actual turf when we're aerating in this time period. We wanna avoid doing it in midsummer, one, because we have all this root growth and we're damaging the plant quite a bit by, by uh, 
uh, aerifying and pulling these roots up to the surface. Uh, and also in a summer like we're dealing with right now, we're dealing with extreme heat and drought. And so this can actually put some uh, additional stress on the plant. So stay out of this midsummer zone. If you miss spring, you do have another window of opportunity to aerate in the fall. Uh, but as we get into winter, I would avoid doing it. Uh, but again, the best time here is going to be right in here, uh, early part of April into May uh, to get that done before the grass really puts on a lot of uh, root growth. So there is a question. Mm -hmm. um, is thatch caused by mulching instead of bagging the grass? It can. Um, it can. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, you need to have uh, mulching blades put on your mower. Um, so if you if, if you just have a, a normal cutting blade and you take the bagger off and, and you just you're just um, leaving those clippings in the lawn, uh, it tends to be too coarse, too large a material uh, that cannot biodegrade quickly enough. And so as that kind of compiles on the surface, it starts to develop into thatch. So if you're, if you're dealing with a thatch issue and you're, you're leaving your clippings on the lawn, you wanna make sure that you have a mulching blade installed on your mower. And if, you, if you're not familiar with that, instead of having a smooth knife edge on it, it just it has all these little knife fingers on there that cuts those uh, leaf blades into smaller pieces and particles so that they are digested much quicker in the, uh, in the turf profile. <clears throat> so you'll see uh, lots of different uh, types of aerators. I would strongly prefer this hollow tine, which uh, actually um, pokes down in the ground as we see with this and then dislodges that core out onto the surface versus the solid tine, which is just a solid metal spike that goes down and just pokes a hole wherever it goes down into the soil. This is pretty good, but it's very temporary compared to this that actually pulls that soil out, uh, which really um, does a better job at alleviating soil compaction particularly if you have a, a really compacted hard pan, uh, it breaks through that. And then now we have a core that goes down into that subsoil where we can get more organic matter, water and, and uh, oxygen down deeper into the soil profile. Um, <clears throat> so you know, this, the solid time, that's helpful. Don't get me wrong, but if we, if we get to choose, I find, find one that has this hollow tine. And this is the tine, the, the spike. All right, planting methods. This one is a fun one for me. Um, so if you get a chance, if we're, if we're putting in sod, um, is do, do the work, okay? If you don't do the work, it's not gonna work out very well. So that the work in this case, is cultivating the surface, bringing in some quality topsoil if you need to, to get the grade of the uh, lawn area uh, done correctly, making sure that we have a good depth of qu quality uh, loose soil so that that sod has a, a great chance to, to establish on, to get its roots down into, uh, eliminating any weedy areas if you have some perennial weeds uh, in the site, it gives you an opportunity to remove those ahead of time so that your grass has a, a clean slate to get started. So we'll go through these kind of one by one. Sod, most expensive. Um, all these are pretty pricey. They're all available. St. Augustine, Bermuda, and Zoysia. You're going to pay a good penny for it. And I've, I've been noticing that the, the price of, of uh, sod uh, <clears throat> has doubled within the last three or four years. Uh, and this is all this whole 
inflation supply chain stuff that, that everybody's dealing with, unfortunately. Uh, but still, economically, uh, it may be the way to go. Um, we got to prepare the soil. Uh, we know water that um, pretty regularly. Um, fertilize about a month after establishment, and then lightly mow uh, a couple weeks after planting. Uh, that's you know raise the mower up just to kind of cut the tops, keep keep it even. Don't go crazy with the mowing, uh, but just to kind of start that process of creating a, a level height within that new uh, planting area. When we're planting sod, do it like this, okay? Not lift with your back, but do it like this. Um, pieces are, are all the way up against the sidewalk. We've created the right height. So this is kind of arced over to the curb. These are offset a little bit in each row, but they're tightly snug up against each other. That's how we want to do it. Okay, there you go. See this brick pattern offset those pieces and um, it'll come together well. I've seen something kind of like this way too many times where people are just trying to save some money and just to kind of throw it out in random spots and in areas that aren't doing well. Yeah, this picture is a little overkill, but you know what I'm talking about. I know you've seen it. This doesn't really work. You know, this grass doesn't have a chance to establish, uh, maybe right in the center, but all the stuff around the sides, um, it's gonna dry out really quick. It's gonna brown out and this, this turf is not going to establish. So if you're gonna invest in sod, don't do it this way. Uh, plugs, uh, if you have a couple small areas that just need to be uh, filled in, plugs are, are a pretty good idea. Um, uh, you see here with this uh, Bermuda grass, uh, how quickly once you get these going, these these stolons, uh, and then the subsequently underground rhizomes are going to move out in different directions, and then this will fill out pretty quick. Um, so a good way to save a little bit of money instead of going with full sod. Uh, the downfall to this is that it's slow to fill in. And then we can start to see some weeds taking advantage of this bare area in here. So what you may wanna do there in this situation is uh, cover these bare spots with uh, maybe an inch of like a good quality compost act as a mulch that would shade these bare areas that will encourage the grass to grow in quicker and will discourage weeds from, from taking advantage of this bare soil. Uh, sprigs is just, you know, uh, vegetative uh, parts of the plant that have uh, stems, stolons, and roots on it. Um, this is uh, the cheapest way of doing uh, vegetative propagation. Uh, time consuming, slow to fill in. How do we keep this alive? Weeds. Uh, so, you know, if you're on a real tight budget, and you've got plenty of time to piddle around with this, maybe not a bad idea. You just start breaking up that grass into pieces as long as we have some stolon with a node and a little piece of root and some stem, then this will root and grow, um, but probably not the, the most uh, practical way of, of filling in our grass. So <clears throat> again, here's a, a picture of a St. Augustine with a very healthy stolon and we can just cut that off and then just bury that uh, in the ground and it'll root and uh, take off from there. Uh, growing from seed. Um, Excuse me Boone. Yeah. Uh, what's the best way to plant a plug? To, excuse me? Uh, what's the best way to plant a plug? Uh, plant uh, the plugs. Um, yeah, you, you really need to use a, probably a post hole digger, uh, and, and, and excavate a hole that uh, would be at the same depth of the, the profile within the plug. So usually you'll buy a tray, uh, has 18 or 24 plugs in it. You just measure the depth 
of the, the media that the roots are growing in. And typically that's about an inch, inch and a half. And you'll use a post hole digger or, or a sharp, sharp shoot to create a divot in that lawn area and in the existing soil. And then actually drop the plug down into that and then use the existing native soil to, uh, to push back around the plug. A little time consuming, but uh, I think if you do it right, it can work. Uh, seeds, um, Bermuda grass, centipede, zoysia, ryegrass. You don't see St. Augustine on here because uh, you can't find St. Augustine seed, uh, nor do you want it. It just doesn't really germinate uh, in a, um, a realistic landscape situation. Um, <clears throat> so it's just not there. Uh, but uh, Bermuda, you can find these blends of Bermuda grass seed available at the nursery centers or the box stores. Um, this is pretty difficult to do. Uh, if you have acreage, uh, you, you know, if I get a phone call and somebody's trying to cover an acre or two acres of a new uh, home site, this is probably what I would do is just a Bermuda seeded onto it or, or uh, maybe Bahia seeded onto it. And then probably closer up around the house, I would do a uh, sod. Um, and these are just the different rates of uh, seed. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you got to create a, a, a quality seed bed. So you've got to cultivate the soil so that it's broken up really well and moist. And when we apply the seed, it needs to come into direct contact with the soil and really kind of nudge down into these little divots uh, in the existing soil so that it can create its own little seed bed as it gets moist and the seed germinates. It's gonna send its little primary root down into the soil that needs to establish first before it grows up. So not only does it need a seed bed, but we have to keep this area moist uh, until all these seeds are established. And sometimes that might mean watering uh, twice a day uh, during establishment, which is a little tedious. All right, so next section is maintenance, turf grass maintenance. Do we have any uh, questions waiting, Suma? No. No more questions as of now. All right, cool. All right, so um, to keep our grass healthy, we need a optimum pH. Well, I'll, I'll talk about pH, uh, balanced and available nutrients, uh, optimum water quality and availability, uh, optimum sunlight, good soil structure, and then appropriate mowing height and frequency and then our good soil and water quality as well. All these we need. Um, <clears throat> this um, law of the minimum is a concept that I see quite a bit in my work that's used to uh, relate plant growth and plant health to this very generic um, concept by Leibig, which basically correlated plant health to a, a barrel filled with water. And that each of these variables of plant health representing one of these wood slats, and that uh, the height of that slat moves down as each of these becomes limited. All right, so in this case here, we have all these variables of plant health. And if we have any one of them, in this case, sunlight, that's, that is limited down to here, then it means that the overall health of the plant can only reach this level, okay? So, so the fact that in this case, the sunlight is limiting, then the whole plant now is only performing 
about two thirds as well as it should be performing for us. If we can address the sunlight and this goes up, well, then whatever this one is here is our next limiting factor. And so the plant starts doing better. And if we can address all of these one by one and, and bring them all the way up to here, then now our plant is working at its full potential. Kind of dorky analogy, but pretty simple. And I think it, it gets the job done. So you gotta address all these things. I guess that's, that's the point here. If we, if we leave one of these out, then we're not gonna get our desired result out of our turf grass. Same thing goes to fruits or vegetables or shrubs or trees or whatever. It's all the same, same concept. So first one is mowing. How often do we need to be mowing? Um, typically about once a week during the active growing season. Uh, using the one third rule is, uh, is don't remove more than a third of the leaf blade or height at any single mowing. Okay, we start mutilating the grass. As I, when I showed you that picture earlier of the grass plant, when we get down, um, you know, even at half of the height of the plant, we start getting into those vital parts of the plant that we are just, we're chopping off and the plant has a hard time rebuilding those uh, between mowings. Uh, so only mow, um, the one third of the overall height of the established turf grass. Um, lots of ways to get grass mowed. Most people are going to use uh, just a, a common uh, gas powered rotary mower. Um, I did borrow my neighbor's electric lawn mower last week just for grins and was uh, pleasantly surprised at the functionality of it. Uh, they have, a, I think it's a 40 volt uh, um, battery cell in these things. And so for a small yard, um, you know, electric mower may, may be the option. Uh, some other ideas here, uh, you know, rabbits, uh, best friends, uh, livestock animals, um, or you can get super creative and uh, come up with some uh, cool uh, country contraption. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, let's focus on some 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 very simple things. Is mowing height. As we get uh, each species, we have a preferred mowing height, with the highest being Bahia and San Augustine, and then moving down to the lower height of Bermuda, that they just prefer um, being at at a certain height. Um, and note here is just, uh, you know, if you mow, the lower you mow the grass, uh, you're making a commitment to mow more frequently, particularly on our St. Augustine grasses. So, so here's our chart. This comes right out of a publication from Aggie Turf, and it shows here with our Bermuda grasses that for home situations, we're looking at one inch to really two and a half inches. So pretty low uh, expectations for the Bermuda. It likes to be cut short. It looks better, it gets more dense, it fills in better. Uh, this is your target range. When we get into our St. Augustine grass, uh, the base is two and a half to four. During the summer months, we're really talking people into going to four because we have a taller uh, grass canopy that those grass blades are capable of shading uh, the soil surface underneath it, keeping the soil cooler and conserving moisture in that soil profile. Uh, I've seen quite a few St. Augustine lawns being mowed at an inch and a half. And it's a lot of inputs that are necessary to continue doing that. And then when we do get into really high drought pressure like we're dealing with right now, those grasses that were cut shorter are going to start showing drought stress much earlier than these grasses that were allowing that grass blade to grow taller. So for us, St. Augustine grass, four inches for the summer. When we get into some cooler, moderate temperatures with more rainfall in the fall, you know, I would maybe bump that down to three. Um, 
so this with Bermuda is just kind of showing the outcome uh, moving into the fall uh, with different mowing height. We have one inch, inch and a quarter, and two inch mowing height. Um, there's the, the, the benefits here uh, are obvious. And with this low height, you know, we're going to have a, 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 a lower, finer texture, green coloration. But this one here is going to need a lot more water and a lot more fer fertilization uh, when we're cutting it at this height. Moving up to inch and a quarter, uh, you know, you're not getting the aesthetics, but we're not having to cut this that often. And we're not having to water or fertilize it nearly as often as well. So the taller the grass, deeper the roots, lots of other good reasons of why we would want to keep this grass taller, um, uh, including our mowing frequency. Um, we we, we want to mow less. Uh, some people just like getting out there. Uh, it's a good uh, therapy, getting out and mowing the grass. Um, personally, that's not me. So I'm going to do the things they're going to minimize the amount of time that I have to spend out there mowing. Uh, this slide here just shows kind of the basic concept of why you would want to keep your blades sharp on your mower is that when we cut this, we get a nice clean cut out of a sharp blade. <clears throat> this can heal off very quickly. If we have a dull blade, it kind of shreds the grass. And now we have a couple things here. We, we're losing water because of this frayed edge. And this also takes longer for it to heal. And so we're inviting open wounds along here for disease or pathogen spores to migrate into the grass to start causing some disease issues. So we don't want this, we want this. And that means probably every spring before you start mowing, it's just uh, flip the mower up on its side, inspect the blade, see how sharp it is and remove that blade and sharpen it or replace it or take it to your uh, lawn repair person to uh, have them address it for you if you're not capable of doing it yourself. Uh, clippings. Um, this is uh, what we talked about earlier is when we have a mulching blade on our mower, then those smaller uh, clippings can filter down and actually turn into uh, fertilizer by breaking down and into organic matter and then re-releasing those nutrients back into the soil profile. If we're not using a uh, mulching blade, the clippings are too large. They don't decompose very well and they can actually shade the grass as they kind of turn into hay on the, on the uh, turf surface. Watering. This one is the most important for us right now. Okay, so what we see with this growth chart, this calendar, particularly our two warm season grasses don't really wake up until April 1st. And there's a couple of things there to think about is that these grasses go dormant and not only do they stop growing and they kind of brown out, they shut off the majority of their root system. Just while they go dormant, they just they just shut the grass of their roots off, migrate back to just a bare minimum of roots, and sit there for the winter. So if we're watering before April 1st, we're we're just wasting water because the grass doesn't even have any roots. I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> what we're watering here are probably seasonal weeds. Okay, so here in the cool season, we're putting fertilizer and water down right in here. Um, we're, we're not doing anything to the grass. We're providing a moist, nutrient-rich area for weeds to take advantage of. So we don't really need to start watering the grass towards the end of March <clears throat> or really April 1st. Then we go through our growth pattern of summer. And then similarly down here, we do we want to do the same thing here. 
start cutting the water back, cutting our fertility back as we move in towards the end of October, as the grass goes into dormancy. Now, we do know that uh, there are um, adverse conditions in our environment. This is going back to 2010 to 11, where we showed we didn't have hardly any drought conditions in the state of Texas. But I find this disturbing here in 2011. This extreme or exceptional extreme drought condition really has almost the shape of Texas here. I don't know how to explain that but not a cool thing. And this is where we're heading this summer, by the way. We're getting close to it. I think we're gonna see this if we don't get some rain pretty soon. Um, we're gonna be back in the same condition that we were in in 2011. Now, if we just hit the rewind button to this time last year, uh, 2000, uh, 2021, um, we were actually above average rainfall, um, at least through the first half of summer. Uh, with uh, we had uh, exceptional amounts of rainfall for the month of June, uh, which was over nine inches. Uh, this this June, we hardly had any measurable amount of rainfall through the whole month. So we can go up and down. So we're going to have to uh, monitor our irrigation. It's not like we just turn it on. Um, when we have these types of ups and downs, we, we don't want to just turn it on. Um, and just have it run the same every year. We need to look at the weather and we need to adjust and adapt uh, because um, we do need to conserve water and be thinking about our available municipal water supplies. Um, this is not winter. Uh, this is uh, Bermuda grass in a midsummer situation with uh, drought restrictions in place. Let's see here, it says McKinney. Texas, um, but you know, anywhere in North Texas, <clears throat> they get pretty dry and they get pretty hot and there's not that much water. Um, and so they start cutting it off. And so these grasses will turn completely brown and go summer dormant. Um, good thing about the, the grasses that we've selected to be our uh, ornamental turf grasses, is they can handle this. They don't love it, they don't like it, but they can get past it. Um, and if, if we can't handle the brown color, uh, we saw a lot of this back in 2011 and 12, uh, these uh, companies rolling in and, and, and coloring uh, grasses that were going summer dormant. I don't know, I've seen this too. Uh, a funny Austin landscape here, taking advantage of a, uh, a, a summer, Summer drought situation. I don't know if that's going to work for your HOA, but uh, some examples of where people have uh, made light of drought, summer drought situations. So, talk about how much water we need. Um, we need to apply water uh, or rainfall, really, <clears throat> just to get into this zone right here where we have an acceptable appearance appearance uh, and we have some moderate stress on the turf grass. So there's no stress, probably not sustainable for us. This is applying a whole lot of water and inputs. Uh, survival and persistence is the other end of this where we're just kind of letting the grass start to die out or we're going to do a couple inputs so that we keep it um, acceptable in appearance. So how much water do we need? Well, we need to do a little bit of homework on that to, to help us decide how much water our irrigation system, if we have one, or um, just even a hose in uh, sprinklers are applying to the grass to help us decide how, decide how often we need to be doing that um, instead of just guessing. So, these are these uh, fancy catch cans, but you can use a tuna fish can or catfish coffee can, something like that. Uh, ruler, stopwatch, and in 15 minutes of your time. So what this shows here is a, a audit where 
we've uh, we've got the catch cans in it from from different areas within each zone in the landscape. We've measured how much we've captured in inches in that 15 minute time period. And then we've extra extrapolated that into larger amounts of time. And basically what this what this shows here is this, you know, 20 minute 20 minutes. Um, we're at about uh, a quarter uh, of an inch to half an inch of water applied uh, in the landscape. Okay, so <clears throat> if we look at this right here, what we see is this tolerance. Okay, and so these is this is a St. Augustine grass, in which within each one of these, we've applied uh, different quantities of water from a tenth of tenth of an inch a week, all the way up to one inch of water a week. And so, so the concept with this is that, you know, this is like no stress, you know, perfect dark green, but we can start cutting this back and we see a little bit of change here, but it's really not till we get over here into this quarter inch that we start to see a line where a person may see that it's not acceptable. Start to see some dieback, some thatch or some browning in there. So right here for me is kind of the line. So it would suggest that we can really go down to a half an inch a week, okay? Half an inch a week to, to maintain what I think is an acceptable quality of turf grass, okay? Half an inch a week. So I'm gonna go back to this slide, okay? <clears throat> that shows here in this zone, in 20 minutes, this is just one application of irrigation. It's just one watering. We're, we're getting half an inch here, okay? And here we're getting close to it, 0 0.3, 0 0.32. So what this suggests is that in this landscape, in just one 20 minute watering, we're getting half an inch. We're getting enough water to maintain a grass that looks of this quality, half an inch a week, okay? So for the people that want to argue with me and say, well, that I have to water it every day or it won't look good, okay? It, I would say here's half an inch a week. This is one application of water. So if I water on Sunday and I water like a cyclone stoke rotation, so I'm putting 20 minutes of water out on the lawn, one day a week, and I'm applying half an inch, my grass should look like this, okay? It's not magic. It's not, it's not us just trying to fool people into using less water. This is science, folks. It's right here, all right? So one day a week, half an inch, you can get it done. Most of the time for St. Augustine grass, we're, we're telling people, you know, an inch a week, because that does get you this, but you can you can uh, deficit irrigate intentionally, given less than it needs, but you still get a pretty good appearance, okay? So that what I'm telling you here, you can apply half an inch a week and get a grass that looks good. So we also, we have this, this curve here that suggests <clears throat> that as we move up to the amount of water that we're applying, we get better and we get this optimum growing condition. And then there's a point here on plant health where when we apply too much water, plant health goes down. And the plant health going down means that we're starting to get more problems with thatch, with uh, drought tolerance, with disease pressure and insect pressure. All these things start building up as we, deliver way more water than the plant actually needs. Do we have a, a question, Suma? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, in your uh, example, um, are you assuming the uh, half inch per week uh, when there's no rainfall? That's a very good question. Now that's combined moisture. Okay, combined <clears throat> So, yeah, so if we're getting that, so that uh, one inch, when we say one inch for St. Augustine grass, that's how much um, the plant needs 
to to perform at its maximum health. So whether or not we're getting that from rainfall, irrigation, or a combination of both, uh, that is uh, where we want to be at. So okay. what I uh, <clears throat> is not a presentation on irrigation, but um, basically I would you know set your your controller for um, a, a conservative programming. Um, and when we get into a, a low pressure system and, and rainfall, um, just turn it off. Just turn your controller off for a couple of days. If we're going through a, a, a cloudy and rain uh, pattern, and then when we start getting back into a, uh, a droughty uh, stress situation, then just turn that back on to deliver uh, anywhere between that half inch to one inch per week rate. Okay. Um, all right. Now, so, what, the, is, yeah, what, what is the average temperature are you assuming in your experiment? Uh, well, this is a, in a greenhouse situation in Dallas, so um, probably 100 degrees. Okay. So, that's uh, perfect for this weather. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Hotter than it is outside in a greenhouse would be actually would be hotter. Um, yeah. And then you know that's the funny thing I've I've heard several people mention well, the, the heat the heat is just killing stuff. The, uh, you know if we when we get up to probably 100 130 degrees, we start having heat related um, direct Stress. impact to plants. Um, but the temperatures that we have here, it's it's really is not the heat plants can handle the heat it's just the it's just the moisture hmm. they, they need water they need oxygen and water and sunlight uh, the heat is not really impacting them so there's a question from lynn uh, how does the quality of the soil affect the water needs big big time yeah, yeah. And yeah she yeah. made she made a come may have came on late but basically late, yeah. uh just a compaction of soils um definitely uh, impacts the uh, oxygen and the moisture retention capability of soil. So uh, the better uh, quality and the deeper that your topsoil profile is, uh, the better your plants are going to be. <clears throat> this one here was just kind of a fun experiment that uh, they did up in College Station a couple of years ago. Obviously, they spent a couple dollars, but basically it was for all those haters out there that said um, that you had to water uh, these warm season turf grasses. So they, they got some sponsors. They built this elaborate uh, train system with this uh, uh, kind of a greenhouse cover over it. And they planted randomized plots of all of our common turf grasses um, and watered it, established it. And then they moved this tarp, this cover over it where it got sunlight, but they didn't get rainfall for 60 days. Um, this was completely covered, so not even dew on the plants. And when they moved this off of there, uh, this is kind of what, what they saw. And these, again, these are like five by five foot plots, randomized. So they, after 60 days of uh, summer weather, this thing moves back and they start watering uh, the grass appropriately and charting. Uh, recovery. So St. Augustine grass. Uh, so day 12 of, of opening this back up, um, we went, uh, all the varieties moved up the same direction. And 78 days later, we're 100% green cover. Um, Zoysia grass at uh, 78 days, all the varieties, which are these different lines, moved up to 100% green cover. Um, Bermuda grass and buffalo grass uh, very quickly responded. Uh, almost at day, day 19, they were already back up to 80% green cover and then gradually all went to 100% cover at 78 days. Um, so a little on the geeky side, uh, but just to, 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 to provide solid evidence that these grasses can handle um, not being watered. Uh, they can go into the uh, drought uh, 
related dormancy. And then, you know, once we get rainfall or we're irrigating that again, or the temperatures cool down, the grasses will recover on their own. So just geeky stuff, thought I'd want to share that. Fertilization, um, we don't want to overdo it, <clears throat> but plants do need um, a, a list of nutrients to perform well for us in a landscape situation. So this right here is a report from a soil sample that sent, was sent to our lab up in College Station uh, for a lawn. And so this result shows here our pH of 6.2. And then these are all of our macronutrients. That these are all of our main nutrients for plant health, uh, growth, and development. And so we see the first one here is our nitrogen, and this is limited, quite significantly. So it's recommending that we have about a pound of nitrogen added per thousand square feet. Our phosphorus is low, our potassium is low, and it shows the rates that they're recommending per thousand square feet. Also here. Sulfur is a little bit low there. We can address that or not. Um, <clears throat> it just suggests the importance of, of doing a soil sample versus just grabbing a bag of fertilizer because each of these situations is very different, lawn by lawn. And so this rate here, you know, uh, like, like that's a one, one, two, two rate. Like that's hard to find. If we just go back, if you go buy a bag of lawn fertilizer, it's not going to look like that. So you you have to, you need a blend, you need to make a fertilizer mix that is going to correspond to the nutrient needs of the soil uh, in that profile. And it's not difficult to do. Um, <clears throat> on our uh, soil testing lab website, we have some calculators that show uh, different commonly available blends and rates of fertilizers. Um, and then you can contact uh, your extension office or your master gardener hotline, and we can help uh, guide some of those product decisions for you. Um, so yeah, the kick side to that, besides wasting nutrients and spending extra money is that if we're putting stuff on there that the soil doesn't need or the plants don't need, then it leaches off. It runs off, it leaches into our groundwater, it goes down into our creeks and bayous, or uh, it just evaporates into the atmosphere. And so not only are we wasting it, but we are polluting our environment, which is not cool. Um, so pH I mentioned, and just to kind of sum pH up, if you're not too uh, familiar with it, a chemist would call this the power of the hydrogen ion, but just uh, basically shows how different elements can be bonded up in the soil if our pH is low, which is acidic, or high, which is basic on this side. Okay, our, our average uh, pH is seven. So really our sweet spot for most plants is six and a half to seven is our sweet spot because we see all these uh, elements that are necessary for plant growth. They're all most available in this area here. They're all most of plant available. So as we move further into this acidic condition, there's probably nitrogen in the soil, but the more we move off that direction, it becomes less available. It's bonded into the soil. And the same thing as we go here to more basic condition. So try to keep our pH uh, between 6.5 and 7. And we can do that by the addition of lime or sulfur to either buffer our pH up or down. So test the soil. I'd say every three years is a good um, pattern because within three years, you will start to see some differences as far as the chemistry of the soil. We're gonna use our frost dates for um, um, applications and we're not gonna exceed <coughs> um, um, amounts of nitrogen because um, there's a good chance that that is going to 
uh, leach off of the landscape surface and into either groundwater or surface water in the area. Um, if we're recycling our clippings by mulching, uh, that can be recycled into nutrients back into the soil so we don't have to fertilize as much. <clears throat> so as far as timing goes, here for us, uh, first application of fertilizer about April 1st. Uh, sometimes that's April 15th, depending on how uh, cool we are. Sometimes we warm up earlier, so April 1st is good. But if it's still cool out, you want to push that to about April 15th. There's no reason to fertilize before that. Like I mentioned earlier, you're just fertilizing the weeds. Uh, so in the fall, same thing. Um, temperature starts getting getting cool. Um, around October 15th, we have our first frost date in Dece on December 1st. So we want that fertilizer to have already benefited the grass and kind of migrated away before we get our first frost. Because if the grass is still actively growing and we get a frost on it, uh, it's gonna get damaged. It's gonna, it's gonna experience cold damage. So last fertilization, October 15th. So lots of things, this is kind of uh, too bad if you do, too bad if you don't, right? If we don't fertilize enough, we get poor growth. Um, we can get disease and insect because of plant stress. But if we put too much fertilizer, it's gonna grow fast, too fast. And then we're also gonna get diseases and insects, okay? So you wanna be there in the middle ground, um, not too little, but not too much. Uh, this chart here just shows kind of how fertilizers uh, uh, readily available, quick response fertilizers affect grass. It shoots up and you get a lot of growth really quick and then it kind of falls off. So this is this is like us uh, drinking a, a, a can of soda as we get hyped up and then we fall out really quick. So, so don't use these quick release fertilizers. You'll see on the bag, it'll say like 24 hour green up or something like that. Uh, don't do those. We want slow release fertilizers uh, or even organic formulations that are going, you're going to see a smaller curve where that fertilizer is going to last a lot longer for us. And that's going to help the plant continually uh, be healthy because it's got a more sustainable growth pattern to it. Um, what do we need to do about fertilizers? Uh, how do I find certain blends? Uh, like I mentioned, the website here on soiltesting.tamu.edu, uh, we've got calculators uh, in there that show you how to find the best rate uh, uh, of fertilizer for your per particular needs. Sometimes you can find one fertilizer that does it all. Uh, and in some situations, you might have to blend amounts of two different fertilizers to get the rate that you need. Uh, be careful when we're fertilizing. You can see here, we can kind of see where this person went back and forth. So you might want to do a crisscross pattern so that we get better coverage and more even greening within the turf grass. Just be real careful with it. A um, um, couple of questions on fertilizing. Yeah, Suma, let me hold those to the end. Okay. Because, and if those people want to stay on, okay. I, don't, I don't want to hold everybody else. Um, okay. Because I'm looking at my time and I've got more slides than I've got time. So let's let's knock these out and then I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll stay on as long as we need to answer any questions that we have. Um. So there are a lot of things that may uh, show uh, plant stress um, in, in a bad situation. Um, we just need to start thinking about how uh, we can address those. So first is identifying uh, um, the, the issue, looking at the symptoms, identifying the underlying causes of those, and then trying to address both of those things in a, in a smart way. So it's not just, um, you know, fixing the visual, 
impacts of the plant, but it's figuring out why it got there and how do we address the issues, uh, uh, the, the environmental issue to, uh, to address the needs of the, uh, of the plant. And roll through that. So, um, so zoysia, like I, we mentioned earlier, this can handle uh, a shady situation. The more shade we get, this turf grass is going to continually minimize. So we have to figure out what we're going to do there. Uh, St. Augustine grass as well can tolerate some shade, but as these trees grow wider and the canopy becomes thicker, we might start seeing more issues with shade uh, related impacts to the plant. So we either have to raise the cutting height of the grass, we need to address the tree canopy by thinning the tree, or in some areas we're gonna have to just replace with a mulch or a ground cover uh, and removing those turf situations if it's just gotten too shady. So this one's kind of goofy talking about disease <clears throat> is, is figuring out what's the situation that we've got. We start to go through a checklist of diagnostics that might figure out, get, get us to a point where we can, we can understand what the issue is and then how do we remedy that? And it may not be specifically with, the, with like a fungicide here, but there's probably another reason why it's like this is because we, we may be in a low spot or we may be watering the plant way too much. So uh, disease things that we deal with most commonly is this large patch or what we call brown patch. And this is a disease that shows up in the fall or early, early spring in these weird uh, geometrical circles in the landscape really is because of too much fertility and too much moisture in the soil. So if we can knock back the fertility uh, or dial that in a little bit better and then cut back on the watering, large patch goes away. Or, you know, plenty of fungicides that are labeled for, for a large patch. But again, if we decrease the watering, <clears throat> we address low lying areas. Uh, in the landscape, we can get rid of that. Uh, this one, just take all root rot or take all root decline. We've been seeing this quite a bit and fortunately not as easy to control. Uh, you just start to see these areas that start to die back gradually um, where the stolons start to dry up and then the leaf sheets start to turn brown. Um, not a good, not a good thing. What can you do for it? Uh, there are some fungicides that are um, kind of pricey, but effective. Um, are we gonna? We may try to uh, remove that area and reestablish, um, or we may just decide to uh, take the grass out of that area and put in a ground cover or mulch in that spot. Um, as I mentioned there are some fungicides to control the take-all patch. Um, but again, the cost and the regularity of treatment for this uh, may be prohibitive for some homeowners. Um, St. Augustine decline is a, a viral based uh, disease with St. Augustine grass that really just shows up as this, this stunted grass with a modeling on it. And unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot that you can do for this. Uh, beyond uh, removal of this uh, variety, go to a variety that's resistant to the, the disease or move to a different uh, species of grass, which would be zoysia or Bermuda grass. Not very common here. That's a good thing. All right, weeds. Let me go into run through weeds real quick. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the best type of herbicide right here is uh, grubs, hand, hand trowels. Uh, uh, one of our master gardeners, uh, Larry, showed us a demonstration on this little weeder here. Pretty cool. Just twist it, pops the weed right out of the ground. Uh, pretty effective. But, uh, you know, sometimes we get these situations where we have grasses 
within grasses and those become very difficult for us to control because there's not a lot of herbicides that work awesome on it. Um, and you could do a little homework as far as different uh, selective herbicides. Um, but good thing with this is that uh, here's the seed head on Bahia. So if we don't want this, then we just, we try not to let it go to seed uh, and just have to mow the turf more regularly so that uh, these weedy grasses don't have a chance to establish. In the winter, we see a lot of this annual bluegrass. Uh, as you see here, it's growing an area that's already sparse. Okay, so keeping your turf grass thick and healthy will help minimize uh, some of the pressure on this. But if we needed a herbicide here, we would do a pre-emergent um, weed killer that we put granules out prior to the germination of these, um, which we would put this on the end of August or about September 1st. Uh, that's gonna stop these annual uh, grassy weeds from ever germinating in the first place. Um, crab grasses, there are some herbicides <clears throat> that are um, labeled um, for controlling crabgrass, but again, a pre-emergent weed killer is the way to go um, to keep, uh, keep them from even starting in the first place. Uh, uh, grass burrs, uh, if you stepped on these, you know what a grass burr is. Uh, Pre-emergent weed killer on this is a good idea. And again, also it's just keeping the grass. There's hardly any grass growing here. So we've, we've created a situation for this weed to establish itself in the, in the, in the landscape. So we've got a, a range of different weeds. Most of the broadleaf weeds are pretty easy to control. We do have a couple, of, but also uh, I'd add a couple other to this difficult section, but that's just me. But um, most of our broadleaf weeds are pretty easy. Uh, and that's just, uh, timing of a, a pre-emergent weed killer, um, the you know cr creating and continuing a good mat of foliage, <clears throat> so that we don't have direct sun exposure uh, onto the ground surface where those weed seeds can germinate in the first place. Again, if we're misapplying uh, with our watering and fertilization, we're in, we're creating situations where these weeds can grow. You see all this, this area in here where it's, there's, it's just very sparse. But this is, a, these are perfect spots for weeds to germinate into. So uh, trying to minimize those, those bare areas if you can. Um, if you can't is uh, I would recommend putting a good layer of compost over these dead spots uh, that will create a barrier of uh, sunlight so that the weeds will not germinate. A lot of herbicide options that are out there. The one thing that's most important is make sure you read the label. Make sure you read the label because you can apply the incorrect product and cause significant harm to your turf grass and um, trees and shrubs in the area. I'm gonna get past buttonweed here. This is another perennial grass. Um, there are some herbicides that are, that work on this, but main thing, just just turn the water off. You've been watering way too much because this is a swamp plant. So if you're creating a situation that that resembles swamp, that's why you have Virginia buttonweed. Don't do it. Similar to this doveweed, um, this likes uh, real wet situations. Um, so we can apply some herbicides on this, but just cutting the water back, then we change the environment that's not conducive for these moisture loving weeds to take hold, including this, this stinker right here is our yellow and purple nut sedge. There are products on the market for controlling sedges, but the best thing here again is not to provide a moisture rich situation where this, these swamp plants, like even this Kalinga um, is a bog plant. So if we're creating a bog, we're gonna get these weeds and they're hard to control. 
Okay, you can't just use herbicides alone. You need to cut the water back. You need to improve the drainage in these areas so that the turf responds and these weeds don't get what they want. Um, lots of horror stories out there. This one here, um, weed and feed, uh, the person used the wrong product. This is for Northern turf grasses, not for Southern lawns and you end up killing your grass. Um, so buyer beware, always read the label, read it twice if you have to, don't buy the wrong product and don't misapply products because you can do a whole lot of harm to your landscape uh, by doing that. Um, <clears throat> just very simple stuff, uh, appropriate mowing, uh, irrigating, fertilizing, uh, the removal of grass if it's just if it's not the right grass for you um you want a you want a good healthy thick stand of grass that will fight weeds um, that will shade them out that will out compete them and so sometimes we just have to be a pretty aggressive and we've got to start from scratch um and then a treatment will be a pre-emergent is putting the product out that will stop those weeds from germinating or a post-emergent that we spray on the active weeds to kill them mid-season. So lots of ways that we can do it, but we need to use all of these together to create an integrated approach to weed management. All right, I'm gonna roll through bugs real quick and we're gonna get this bugger, get this bugger done. These are the these are our monsters. Grubs, not terrible. Chinch bugs, terrible. And these guys, we only see randomly every couple of years. I'll talk about them one by one. Sign that you've got grubs in the soil is you have all these other animals hanging out. Hopefully you don't have these, these nasty pigs hanging out in your yard, but this is the damage that you'll see. They're looking for grubs in the soil. Um, so if you see all these little ruts in the morning, more than likely it's armadillos, skunks, raccoons, or feral pigs trying to get to those little bugs in your yard. And this is what it looks like here. They're a couple inches down into the soil profile. And the sign on that is that you get these kind of very generic yellowing areas in the grass. It doesn't ever kill the grass, but you know they're eating the roots. So the more of them in the soil, the bigger they get, the more roots they're eating. And then subsequently the grass looks stressed out. So we can, we can treat these different ways. Um, there's several uh, chemical treatments. Uh, timing is very uh, crucial when we're talking about grubs because we want to catch them before they get down deep into the soil profile. Uh, chinch bugs, probably seeing these right now. I've been seeing a lot of them driving around. <clears throat> these are all the different uh, growth stages of, of, of the same insect to show how different that they can look, but they're, they're not this big. They're, they're pretty small and they kill the grass. They actually inject the enzyme into the vascular system of the plant that kills it dead. So it's not like they, it just uh, impacts the grass. It actually kills it like this. You have a green patch and then you have this area that looks like somebody poured gasoline on it. That's chinch bugs. This is the size of them here on a dime, just to give you an idea how small they are. When they first start, you'll see an area like this that's dead. And then a week later, it'll look like this. That's chinch bugs. So you want to catch this. If you start seeing these areas that don't that look kind of dead, we want to get down in there. I'm getting Ooh. a video of it now. Oh, a video. That's yeah. a little chinch bug right there. That's how small it is. This is a little immature. It should be right here. So just showing you, they're pretty small, but you can't see them. Uh, lots of ways to identify them. Uh, some people use this this uh, bottomless coffee can, fill that with water, and the little chinch bugs will float to the surface. I just spray that uh, grass area with a high pressure jet of water, and the chinch bugs will come to the surface. Once you see one, <laughs> you've seen enough. So we got to start thinking about something that we can use to control these because, like I said, once they've killed this grass, it's dead for good. So it's better to 
start early. If we identify the chinch bugs in an area is control that before they have a chance to kill a large swath of your grass. Uh, I mentioned these other uh, you know, temporal uh, visitors. Uh, a couple years ago, maybe for two, two or three years in a row, we had a pretty big wave of these tropical sod webworms. Uh, it's a little moth, uh, flies around in the evening, uh, clusters kind of hangs low around the turf, but this is its little green larvae. It's this kind of shiny green color and they just, just annihilate grass. Uh, they get down low and they eat the nodes and the stolons of the grass and quickly it starts to look really rough. It goes from green to looking pretty nasty within a week or two. So again, if you see these little uh, small moths fluttering around the grass um, towards the fall, um, we know that we're probably gonna start seeing some damage pretty soon. Once you identify what the problem is, we want to try to address that. Um, some of these are chemical, uh, products. There are some biologicals or organic products that are pretty effective at controlling this as well. Same response. Uh, I'm not sure that. Um, same response would be to this guy here is our fall armyworm. It's a little bit bigger. It's a moth, um, a little bit larger in size, more brown in color. Um, but you'll start seeing these worms, they call them army worms because there's armies of them. There'll be thousands moving around on the grass and they just chomp the foliage from the top down and can really annihilate a turf surface uh, within a couple of days. So the response would be the same. Uh, there's a, a range of chemical products uh, and some of the BT or the bacillus uh, biological products work pretty well uh, also. So a couple quick things here as we move out. Um, let's mow this at the proper height. Again, for, for Bermuda grass, we're talking about two and a half inches. For St. Augustine, let's talk you into four inches over the summer. We want to fertilize according to our soil tests every three years. Okay, if, we, if we're fertilizing um, and we're creating an environment that's too wet and too high in nitrogen, we are um, inviting disease into the landscape. And we're, when we're watering, let's water with conservation in mind. Uh, we don't need to water during the winter. Just turn it off, turn the irrigation system off. And then even in the summertime, as uh, water um, with precision, as, uh, look at the rainfall and adjust your programming as needed to uh, apply the, the right amount of water. <clears throat> would be a good idea to create something like this. It's just a calendar for yourself uh, that helps you kind of keep track of what you did through the year. Again, this was Michael uh, up in Montgomery County and he's a little OCD, he's a lawn guy, but something kind of like this would be a really good idea. Just, just chart this of when you applied certain products on the yard, uh, what those were, so that as we go back next year, we can adjust that so that we get um, a good a good calendar uh, of turf care uh, that works really for you. We can start kind of dialing that in so that our, our grass looks fantastic. Here's a gang of resources for everybody. This will be in the recording for you that you'll get uh, after the presentation. So no worries to have to jot all that down right now. You will get a copy of this. Uh, this is our AM Turfgrass website. Tons of awesome resources. This is our soil and water testing laboratory where you would send those soil samples to. If you're dealing with reoccurring diseases and we're not sure what that is, or we need confirmation of a disease like take all root decline, you would send those samples to our plant disease diagnostic lab, which is this. And then these are here are our local resources. This is our Fort Bend County Extension Office website. And this is our super fine Fort Bend County Master Gardeners homepage. I go visit that for a lot of good resources, including where to get a hold of our Master Gardener volunteer hotline. We've got volunteers here Monday through Friday to answer all of your garden questions. Um, so we'll be 
eager and ready for that. Last thing we're going to ask of you is to take a second or a couple seconds to fill out a brief survey for us. If you got a cool phone, you can uh, you can snap that QR and it'll take you right to our little uh, Google evaluation where you can give us some feedback about the presentation today. I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. And if we have people that wanna hang out a little bit longer, uh, I'd be more than happy to address those questions, Suma. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Bon. This was an excellent class. I think I have several of those problems and you have given some direction on the solutions. <laughs> So uh, Michael, Michael Hand, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions, this is a great time to do that. Yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Sure can. Uh, so I had a few questions there. One about, um, you mentioned about spreading lime to increase the pH of the soil. Um, I think I have some areas in my yard where rabbits are urinating. And uh, I think that's making the soil more acidic. And so there's some brown patches there. Um, so would you recommend spreading some lime in those areas to offset that acidic urine? Um, so it's probably more of the, the uric acid. Um, you know, this is a naturally occurring um, nitrate, uh, like urea, mm -hmm. uh, that's concentrated in urine. So, you know, people who have you know, typically big dogs, um, or would understand this. Um, and it's, it's more of the, uh, those nitrates that are burning the grass, um, than acidifying the soil profile. So I don't think that's the right answer. Um, what, what would, what would probably work best, and I just kind of I throw this at a lot of stuff, but just a, a little bit of good quality compost. If you've got an area that's, that's been impacted um, by, by a lot of things, in, including wildlife or pets, is just a, a sprinkle about a quarter inch of a good finished compost over those impacted areas and water that in uh, really well, like, like inundate that area. Uh, and that's just to dissipate uh, that uric acid and to allow that compost to kind of move down into that area to start balancing out the, um, the profile. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I don't think that the, the pH there is, is being, um, impacted as much as just a concentration of that uric acid. Okay. Next question on it. You said you had a couple. Uh, also, um, you talked about fertilization and I think the or too much nitrogen. Um, the downside you said was that it would uh, cause the grass to grow quicker and require more water. I think with the two things. Is it also um, the risk of burning the grass with over, over uh, nitrogen fertilization? Uh, yeah, particularly with quick release uh, forms of nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see on the bag, it'll say uh, like a quick, quick shot or, or readily available uh, or quick release. Um, you know, from July 1st to September 1st, I wouldn't use those products um, because you will burn the grass pretty bad with those products. But if, you, if you're applying a slow release form, you know, if it, the bag um, specifically uh, notes that that it is slow release, um, then uh, chances of burning are going to be significantly less. Uh, but but really, <clears throat> it's just you know midsummer, especially when we're seeing the 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 drought conditions that we're seeing. Um, just holding off on fertilization in any amount until we see some relief, uh, primarily is in natural rainfall. I wouldn't be fertilizing at all right now. Now the burning that happens, is it actually killing the grass? Um, no, because most of the fertilizers, they're, um, they're bonded by with a salt particle. So that's kind of the filler. And then they, 
they combine the nutrients onto the salt filler. And so it's really more of the salts that are on there that are burning the grass more than the actual um, nutrient uh, that's doing that damage. It's, it's, the, it's the salts that are, that are in that fertilizer that, that do the damage. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Other questions? I don't see anything more on the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, please go ahead and do that. Well, we're waiting on that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll talk again about what I've what I've been seeing, um, whether calls or just just observations. A lot of chinch bug damage this time of year because they they like it when it's hot and when it's dry, and and what I'm, what we tend to see in a homeowner situation is um, pe people just thinking that that's drought stress, uh, and they're they're watering. Uh, or watering and fertilizing in response to it. And that's not doing anything besides probably actually exacerbating the, the, the problem with the insect. Uh, so I would encourage people to, to look for those little dead spots, patchy dead areas, and try to find some of the chinch bugs there and address that um, with an appropriate product before they, they, they go and make the, the wrong decision. The other thing that, um, again, I've seen more and more of is this take all root decline. So if you're not sure uh, if that's what you have, I would suggest taking a couple pictures of the areas, um, even digging up a small portion of that grass and either sending pictures or coming in here and bringing in a grass sample to our hotline and have, having uh, one of us take a look at that and we can kind of start the process of how we confirm that. We need to confirm it because the response is drastic. So once we know that that's what it is, then we'll, we would, we're, we're always happy to walk people through the response as far as a, a, an integrated uh, approach to um, remedying that, including the use of uh, fungicides and again these are fungicides that can be kind of pricey so we want to make sure that we're doing that the right way so that we're uh, you know max maximizing the the results from from our, from those costs Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, Boone, it's Michael again. Um, there's a, I think it's a spectricide product that it says it kills um, both chinch bugs and grubs. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but do you, do you think that's an effective insecticide? No. Sorry, Spectricide. This is a granular product. Yeah. No. Well, they, no. Al they also make a, there's a, a liquid, uh, I think it's called triazamine. Yeah. Yeah. It's granular and, it, and they have it in a liquid form that you can, you know, spray with a, a hose. Sure. Um, so the, the granular products, are, you know, if you're, if you're using this as a, as a, a preventative measure, kind of early season, those products work pretty good. It's just a general kind of blanket product. But once you've seen chinch bug damage, then you're on a pretty fast timeline of responding. And a granular is just not going to work because it's not impacting those active populations. So you really have to do a liquid. And pref preferably, you would use a product that has one of these uh, RTU hose end applicators or you can really drench the, the foliage of the grass down thoroughly um, because we want to eliminate that active population as quick as possible. So you have to actually get contact on the pests for those types of products to, to work. They, they're contact insecticides. Uh, they're not 
systemic in ways that it's going to impact those those active populations. So the ones that hook on the water hose and you just turn yeah. the little on or off and just thoroughly saturate those spots mm -hmm. where you're seeing the damage, that's going to be the way to go. Okay. What what product would you recommend for that that I could get it like, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot? Yeah, that's where I can't do product endorsement. Uh, usually you'll see four, three or four options. They're going to say, you know, for general uh, lawn um, pest control, um, most of them, if you look at the active ingredients, they're, they're all about the same. Okay. But that triazid, whatever it is, um, that's the liquid form, that would, it sounds like that would be. It's in, it's in, that, it's, it's in that category as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And do you recommend spraying the entire lawn or just around those brown patches? I, I would just focus on those patches and then, you know, maybe six feet out away from there, assuming that some of those live adult populations have already started migrating into the healthy turf. But okay. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it across the whole surface because we do have beneficials um, that are balancing mm. uh, some of these issues for us for free. Uh, so, you know, if we don't have to impact those populations, then then we try not to. OK, and then those small brown patches that are there. Dead. So. Just do I just wait, I guess wait it out and it'll eventually the Bermuda will grow back in and fill that area in. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. My generic response is, is a, a thin layer of a good quality compost mm -hmm. and just cover those dead spots. Um, mm -hmm. One that, 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 that kind of mulches the ground surface. So you don't get weeds growing in there. And then you, you start to create this more of a dynamic uh, soil profile that is attractive to those grass runners to move back in there. Right. Should I pull out the, the dead grass before I put the compost in? No, I wouldn't. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep, you're very welcome. Other questions, Suma? No, thanks uh, a lot, Bond. It was a great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Suma, I appreciate it. And uh, like, like I said, if we have any follow-up questions from folks, is uh, reach out to us here at the office and, and the hotline. I'm glad to help you.